Okay, thank you to the organizers for the opportunity to present this topic. Let's start with uh, some disclosures. Um, and uh, when I uh, wanted to start this, I think one of the important messages that I wanted to uh, leave you with is when we talk about how to treat a BRAF mutant uh, colorectal cancer, I think we need to recognize that in the era of NGS testing that we're really getting a, a wide spectrum of BRAF mutations uh, that are coming out. So I wanted to uh, break my talk into two parts and spend most of the time talking about the the canonical activating alteration V600E uh, in the, the BRAF oncogene. It's present in about seven to, uh, in some series, as I'll mention, higher, uh, up to 15% of, of metastatic colorectal cancer patients. But also acknowledging, and I'll spend a few minutes uh, at the end, talking about this atypical, or also called non-V600 uh, BRAF mutations, which is present in about 4% uh, of the patients. So first, uh, BRAF V600. And as, as you've heard, there's been a number of, uh, of uh, guidance that has now appeared in, uh, in guidelines about how to think about uh, and, uh, and address BRAF V600E. So I wanted to take you through kind of what the, well, at least three major guidelines are saying in terms of both the testing, uh, utilization of standard therapies, targeted therapies, and then uh, how to uh, address and target BRAF directly. So when it comes to, to testing, I think now we're seeing a clear, uh, uh, clear universal recommendation that BRAF mutation testing should be part of the standard of care and part of the panel that we're doing, regardless of the methodology. And, uh, and part of this is uh, based on the strong prognostic information that comes from it and also uh, uh, potential for clinical trials. So what do we mean when we talk about the prognostic information? I think it's been recognized now for a while that BRAF V600E mutations are both biologically very distinct, but also have a clinical very distinct uh, behavior as well, meaning that has a very poor prognosis. And here's a, a series, uh, nice uh, summary uh, among many that just show median overall survivals from over two years down to 11.7 months in the setting of a BRAF V600E mutation but also acknowledging that these are patients that, we, that uh, behave differently in the clinic. The tumor has uh, more predilection to have peritoneal metastasis, retroperitoneal lymph node involvement, and even the, the higher rates, although still rare, of CNS metastases as well. So this is a, just an acknowledgement that we're dealing with a very different type of, uh, of tumor. But we also recognize that we're probably underappreciating the uh, amount of and the significance of BRAF uh, mutated disease. And I think we all acknowledge that there are patients that, uh, that don't even make it to see a medical oncologist with metastatic disease. There are patients that maybe w we see briefly but are not uh, suitable candidates because of their performance status and aggressive disease for treatment. And this is a nice uh, study uh, uh, led by John Laurie and BC looking at the Victoria uh, registry, population-based uh, uh, setting. And here, the prevalence, first of all, is probably twice as high as what we're seeing for metastatic disease in the kind of academic series uh, that we commonly report. And importantly, when you look at an entire population with or without treatment, what you can see is that patients with a BRAF V600E mutation in a population-based uh, registry have a median survival of six months. So I think just acknowledging that there are these patients out there that, uh, that really are underappreciated uh, in, uh, in many series. The other reason it's underappreciated is we're not always testing right off the bat. Um, and that there's really barriers in dissemination of even the KRAS, NRAS, BRAF testing. Um, this is some data that's now uh, maybe two years old, but I would posit that uh, we still haven't uh, really improved uh, as much as we'd like, at least in the U.S., that if you actually look at the rate of patients who have molecular testing done before uh, first-line therapy, uh, that the rate is, in this uh, uh, survey of community and broad-based practices, 13,000 patients, only 11%. So only 11% of patients have that BRAF information early on. 
Now, that, some of that testing is done later, but uh, certainly this acknowledgement that if we need this information to really understand how to manage patients, that's not always there. So I uh, would just make a, another plea for education, awareness, and certainly acknowledgement of what's going on in many of the patient advocacy groups uh, and really trying to, to uh, increase uh, uh, awareness in the patient community about getting uh, your biomarkers done. So what about BRAF mutation and EGFR antibody use? This is an area where there had been a little bit of, of gray for a while, but I think now we're seeing the guidelines coming down fairly clearly saying that uh, EGFR uh, therapy, cetuximab, panitumumab, uh, either alone or in combination with cytotoxic chemotherapy uh, should only be used in BRAF wild type uh, patients. Now, uh, this comes up because there's always this angst about a patient who has exhausted a lot of therapies with BRAF and, uh, and you haven't used an EGFR inhibitor. And uh, part of it is based on large uh, series like we usually do, trying to understand in meta-analyses what's the potential benefit of uh, an EGFR uh, regimen in combination with chemotherapy. And here, even though it's almost 30, or 30, excuse me, almost 3,000 patients, it really is difficult to clearly uh, 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 and I think we can argue there's really no evidence of activity in the BRAF uh, mutant population with an EGFR inhibitor, but wide confidence intervals and small margins. But I would actually just uh, share some additional data that actually uses the biology of the tumor to really understand are we doing anything when we give an EGFR inhibitor alone in a BRAF mutant tumor. So the concept here, and this is a little thought experiment, is to say if you have a sensitive tumor that you're then uh, providing a selective pressure to, the tumor will adapt and evolve and you'll see clonal outgrowths. You'll see mechanisms of resistance develop in these, right? We're well used to this concept now in RAS wild type. But if you have a tumor that has, that uh, is not really having any selective pressure applied, is a cetuximab, in this case, insensitive tumor, you won't see any evolution in the tumor over time. And uh, there won't be any mechanisms of resistance. And so uh, work uh, led by uh, Christine Parsigian, who's a junior faculty in our group, again, used this methodology in a, in a, a, a cohort. It was able to show, for example, left-sided tumors, you indeed see this selective pressure. Transverse, we saw uh, broadly selective pressure. Right-sided tumor, no evidence of any selective pressure, right? This is data that we now know. And when you do the same for BRAF, what we see is that if there's a BRAF mutation in these settings, we were never able to find any evidence that there was any tumors that acquired some other evidence of resistance mechanism, no selective pressure. So I think when we put these two concepts together, one is the classic meta-analysis and one is kind of a biology-based uh, selective resistance, there's really no evidence for activity, I would say, for EGFR inhibitor alone in a BRAF V600E colorectal cancer patient. So even though there is understandable angst about not using them in patients who may be uh, refractory, we really should resist because there's no evidence of benefit that, uh, that can be seen. So what about chemotherapy? So here you see a little bit of divergence in recommendations. NCCN is kind of silent on chemotherapy. ESMO and ESMO Asia suggest the cytotoxic triplet of Fulfoxiri uh, may be appropriate in fit patients uh, with BRAF mutations. And this is based on uh, data, so the tribe data uh, that you can see. And it, it biologically makes sense to us, right? An aggressive uh, patient, uh, aggressive tumor, uh, needs aggressive therapy, perhaps, and so uh, what you can see here in the two green lines is the kind of the data that underlies at least some of these recommendations for this combination. But I think we also have to acknowledge that the numbers are small. Uh, the p-value is not significant. You can see the hazard ratio is fairly broad. Um, and I think fortunately we'll have a little more clarity and I encourage everyone uh, tomorrow at the uh, morning session in here there'll be an update on the tribe 2 data looking at a larger population of the biomarkers that will include uh, the BRAF uh, question as well. So we may have a little more clarity to this uh, in the near future. How about uh, BRAF mutations and targeted therapy? So here uh, you see a, certainly a very difference in, uh, in practice patterns. The NCCN 
uh, certainly much more liberal in what is considering standard of care, uh, recently identified three different regimens that were considered part of the standard of care for uh, uh, therapy in the U.S. at least. Uh, and, uh, and again, not, uh, not anything on the guidelines yet for BRAF-targeted therapy on the ESMO or ESMO Asia. Um, so I wanted to walk you through some of the data for these, uh, for these three. Um, I think uh, just acknowledging historic data here that's saying that, that uh, why are we looking at combinations? Here is uh, the uh, historic data about uh, BRAF inhibitor for V600E and melanoma, but also in refractory colorectal cancer here as well, very different response rates. And there's been certainly a, uh, an emerging understanding of why that is. And, uh, and this is a, a story that, is, uh, that continues to reiterate uh, in colorectal cancer, the concept of adaptive resistance, this concept that homeostatic regulation is a critical and nearly universal feature of biologic systems, especially growth factors, right? There's a lot of, of rationale why a tumor should have this, uh, this feedback mechanism to shut off growth signaling. And when one inhibits a single node in this network, the, the network adapts and will compensate. And so I'll, I'll try to take you through with an animation to really explain what is happening. So we know with the presence of a BRAF mutation, you see in green the downstream activity. Uh, when you inhibit BRAF, what happens is you then get uh, inhibition of the downstream initially. But what you do is you lose some of these feedback mechanisms uh, that were keeping upstream signaling in check. So you shut down these feedback inhibitory uh, mechanisms. As a result, then you have increased signaling upstream that then uh, bypasses and reactivates the downstream uh, signaling pathway. So this is why when you give a BRAF inhibitor alone, we don't see activity because these networks are different in melanoma than they are in colorectal cancer. And so the idea is that in order to optimize this, what you need to do is, is tackle BRAF, but also then inhibit EGFR alone. And when you, I'm sorry, in combination with BRAF. And when you do those two together, then that's when you get uh, uh, inhibition of the pathway. And that's really been the fundamental uh, observation that's led to a number of clinical trials that have been done. This is just summarizing a number of both the early singles and then doublets and now triplet uh, therapies. These are all single arm phase two uh, or one uh, uh, studies uh, respectively. Uh, and, but I wanted to kind of highlight um, of, uh, the ones that ended up on the NCCN guideline. The one is uh, one that we helped uh, develop early on. It's called the VIC regimen, Vemurafenib, Arena, Tcan, and Cetuximab. Uh, because we know in GI cancers, everything has to have an acronym, right? That's just a rule of thumb. Uh, so VIC regimen is the acronym uh, here. And uh, this set a 35% uh, response rate uh, in the early uh, phase 1B. And you can see a waterfall plot here. Uh, the regimen uh, was formally tested in the SWOG 1406 study. Cetuximab, so arena tecan as the control arm with or without vemurafenib. This was in patients, uh, again, with V600E mutations uh, that had uh, to have one or two lines, prior lines of therapy, so second or third line, no EGFR. And there was an optional crossover. So the primary endpoint was progression-free survival, but important to note that that uh, crossover is, uh, is there. Uh, the primary endpoint of the study has been previously reported was MET, hazard ratio 0.48. You can see the p-value uh, for that, uh, that comparison, uh, that is uh, that comparison there. The response rate, uh, as you can see, the two waterfall plots, and I think the first thing to call your attention to is the top left, which is really just how poorly our standard chemotherapies, in this case, cetuximab and arena tecan was considered the standard at that time, how poorly that does. Right, the low response rate that you see, uh, but also seeing the waterfall plot on the bottom left with the VIC regimen. And this came with, uh, with some addition of uh, some toxicities, uh, some hematologic uh, toxicities that was seen, higher rate of anemia, uh, and a slightly higher rate of, uh, of diarrhea as well, uh, but it's considered manageable in our clinical practice. Importantly, though, no increased overall survival, right? So progression-free survival is met, but no OS uh, uh, analysis or no OS improvement in this study, perhaps because of the, the crossover that was there. Now, importantly, when we start to ask, well, why do patients start to progress on a BRAF-EGFR combination? 
right? Why is it that, uh, that, that, that we get uh, progression-free survival that's not quite as long as we'd like? Well, uh, when we look at this spectrum, uh, remember that the tumor has a, any number of different pathways that it could turn on. It could turn on the PI3 kinase pathway, could turn on uh, other signaling. Um, but what it nearly universally does is reactivate the MAP kinase pathway. So whether it is acquired RAS mutations, uh, amplifications of EGFR, KRAS, MEK mutations, or even atypical, pattern, atypical mutations that when you look and see what they're doing, turns out they're actually activating the MAP kinase uh, pathway. So it's a, it's a very clear signal saying that this is a tumor that is very dependent still on MAP kinase signaling. So that is a, a key, uh, key signal, key biologic insight that then kind of led to really better understanding. So this is some uh, mouse work that I think kind of nicely demonstrates the concept that if you take a BRAF mutant tumor, make it resistant to the combination of a BRAF and EGFR, what you see is acquisition of a KRAS. Here's two different models that had two different KRAS mutations that developed. And now you can show that the BRAF and EGFR doesn't work, but when you go in and do a uh, kind of a high-dose MAP kinase inhibition, again, hit that same pathway that we know is dependent, uh, even in this setting, they're still sensitive. And so this is telling us, uh, reiterating again, that it's all about MAP, MAP kinase pathway inhibition. Um, and so this has been seen in, uh, for example, the other agent, the other, one of the other combinations that's on the NCCN guidelines. This is the only one without randomized data, but on the basis of uh, single arm uh, phase two study uh, here was uh, included, of uh, the dibrafenib, penetumab, trametinib, and you can see waterfall plot associated with that. But then also uh, was part of the rationale behind the Beacon study. So this was a, a large phase three study of ankorafenib, cetuximab, and binimetinib. This again was very similar design to the SWOG 1406, uh, second or third line uh, patients for BRAF V600E only. 615 patients, so very large study, uh, had uh, 250 sites, 15 countries. Um, you can see the patients are randomized to one of three different arms, uh, 200 and, or 205 uh, uh, or approximately 200 patients in each of the arms. Triplet therapy of binimetinib, ankorafenib, and cetuximab versus the control arm uh, was the primary uh, outcome, and both looking at overall survival as well as overall response rate uh, for the, that, uh, that combination. And there's also a doublet arm in there as well, an ankorafenib cetuximab. The safety lead-in, remember, was 30 patients at the very beginning of the study, and that's been reported and now published. Uh, Dr. Van Kutsum uh, in, uh, in uh, JCO earlier in the year, you can see a 48% response rate, so very nice waterfall plots uh, there, and certainly that led to enthusiasm. Uh, this was actually what uh, resulted in it going on to the NCCN guidelines. And, uh, and by press release, uh, Array is, uh, has uh, shared that this is indeed a positive study, met both of its uh, primary endpoints, the response rate and overall uh, survival. The final results of, uh, I'm sorry, the, the study results will be shared tomorrow at, uh, at 9 a.m. So first report of these uh, will be uh, in here uh, during the nine, uh, nine or so uh, session in the morning. So in the last uh, few minutes, what about the others? Right? And I think, again, reiterating that it's important when you get these reports back from the NGS that all BRAF mutations are not the same. So you really have to be careful that if, that, to make sure you're looking at it. And remember that a lot of the, what we've been talking about uh, and everything we've been talking about before this has been about V600E. Uh, the most common, admittedly, but, uh, but certainly you'll see a number of these atypical alterations. So what are they? Well, uh, uh, we and others have shown uh, um, that the prognosis of these, uh, these non-V600E look very much like a wild type, right? So this is not the really poor prognosis uh, subgroup. Uh, so this is the gray uh, boxes, uh, gray curve, uh, as shown here. Uh, 
And uh, interestingly, uh, again, using that same methodology of understanding what is occurring after uh, EGFR inhibition, if you have a, a wild type tumor, what you can see is some of these atypical alterations can start to appear uh, at the time of progression on EGFR. And so this is work by uh, Benny Johnson, a, a talented junior faculty in our group as well. Um, and, uh, and what Dr. Johnson showed was that indeed you can get a number of these alterations that can occur in these subclonal levels. So the sense that, that yes, it's playing a role in signaling, uh, but that it, this is a complex uh, group. And this has been kind of nicely uh, uh, demonstrated and, and a little structure has been added to this heterogeneity uh, by calling these by different classes. And so you'll see in the uh, literature, class one is the V600 that we've been talking about. But then the uh, atypicals are broken into class twos and class threes. And I'll just share a little bit of the biology here, but just to reiterate that, that these are very heterogeneous uh, group. Uh, the class twos are ones that have, uh, still have high kinase activity, uh, but they function as dimers, so that, uh, that they're actually signaling not as a monomer like V600, but as a dimer. They're not dependent, it uh, looks like, on any upstream signaling. Uh, and in order to inhibit this, you really need dimer uh, inhibitors, uh, these, uh, these dimer um, new, new class of therapies that are coming into the, uh, into the clinic. In contrast, class three BRAF mutations are really, you can think of these as amplifiers. They're actually kinase inactive or low, but what they do is they, they uh, partner preferentially with CRAF, so a mixed dimer, and just increase signaling from upstream. So receptor tyrosine kinase signaling gets amplified by the presence of this. So what does that mean? Well, it means that there actually are patients that are responding with these class three BRAFs to EGFR inhibitors. Right? and they can actually respond at a fairly reasonable rate. And so it's important to acknowledge that there are differences here. Class two, I'd say, is still a little unclear. It doesn't look like they respond as much, but we'll have to see as the data matures. Uh, but there may be different strategies uh, moving forward for class twos and class threes, really kind of based on our understanding of this. Um, but, uh, uh, but it is kind of uh, an area that uh, to pay attention to because we'll uh, be looking at that. I'd say for right now, what's the take home? I would just treat all atypical uh, BRAFs, just like a wild type. Uh, until we know more and have better clarity or better therapies, uh, that's the, the wisest course of action. So I'll conclude and just remind the group that V600E mutations have poor prognosis and novel therapeutic options. Make sure BRAF is part of your testing uh, that's being done routinely really no evidence, and hopefully I've convinced you both by meta-analysis and by biologic uh, insights into resistance, that there's really no evidence of EGFR activity for BRAF v 600 e tumors when EGFR inhibitor is given alone, but combination strategies may be uh, needed and uh, shared some of the data there. And again, uh, encourage uh, uh, everyone to uh, hear about the Beacon study tomorrow. Uh, and that non v 600 e mutations represent a mixture of signaling activity and an area to pay attention to in the future. With that, I'll end with acknowledgments and thank you for your interest.